Okay, so She-Hulk Episode 2 is now out, and though the entry is pretty short, it's filled with a lot of easter eggs, callbacks to the comics, and also certain things that tease big storylines for the future. Throughout this video, we're going to be breaking it all down, but please Hulk smash that thumbs up button, and also don't forget to subscribe for videos like this every day. Without the way, thank you for clicking this, now let's get into She-Hulk Episode 2. Now the episode picks up with a news report by KPVK15. This news station has popped up in the MC before, and they're the channel that reported on Giant Man in San Francisco Bay. Here they're reporting on super influencer Titania after her fight with She-Hulk in court last week. We've kind of gone to the next level in the MCU with superheroes now becoming celebrities, and Titania is basically a superstar that has superpowers rather than actually being a hero. When we cut to news Los Angeles, we get a comment from Titania's lawyer that says the entire thing was the result of low blood sugar. I asked the wife if this was in relation to anything, and she told me Kim Kardashian did a low sugar diet that caused a bit of controversy, so, so, so there's your wife's Easter eggs. Now, KZYO also dropped their thoughts too, and throughout we see they use animated images of the courtroom fight. This is done in the style of a court sketch, and it's also the same way that the credits are presented too. Now we actually get one of those credit scenes play out with Jennifer going to her family's for dinner. This was presented to us last week, and on top of that we can also see Jen lifting up a cabinet so that her mother can hoover underneath it. This calls back to the comics, and she actually did the same thing with Jarvis when he was cleaning the Avengers mansion. Now from here, we cut to an eyewitness report. Like, like a chick hulk. A she hulk? Exactly. This is a nice little nod to last week, namely when Bruce was talking about names, and how it's normally the public that give them, rather than people choosing them for themselves. Cut to the legal bar and grill, and we see that Jen isn't too happy about the new name. It's sort of like when I changed from definition to heavy spoilers, or when I brought poor Jared across and everyone started calling him a dead in the comments, but he's a nice guy, yeah? He'll grow on you, I promise, don't, don't unsubscribe! Now they do some meta commentary on how lots of spin-off characters get similar names, like Ms. Marvel, though she is pretty cool, so you can stay. Now they also bring up superhero stereotypes. Six figures in student loans to become a vigilante, that is for billionaires and narcissists, and adult orphans for some reason. Now there's lots of heroes that fit this mold, with Iron Man being the standout. The line itself could also be a callback to the Avengers when Tony said this to Cap. Take that off, what are you? Genius billionaire playboy philanthropist. They also bring up whether the Avengers are even paid or not, which was something that links back to when Falcon tried to take out a bank loan. Now obviously, there's that guy who wanted to take over her speech last week, and he comes in demanding to know how she got her powers. They do this line that, I don't know if it's genius or the most on-the-nose men are bad thing that I've ever heard, but I did chuckle a bit. There's a hot chick over there, I'm gonna go talk to it. Gonna go talk to it. <laughs> me, but, but moving on. Now, over this, we hear the song Never Stop This Flame by Celeste, which... My UK heads will probably be sick of hearing if they've ever watched EPL on Sky Sports. Now last week we guessed that they'd follow the comics and fire her for having the potential to influence a jury. They have this scene here, and it calls back to not only Dan Slot's run, but also sensational She-Hulk. In the former she had to pause her closing statement to go and save the world with the Avengers, and the next day she was called in by her boss and fired for her mistrial potential. This was carried out by the character Blake Tower, who looks exactly the same in the source material as he does here. In Sensational She-Hulk issue 10, Jen saved several jury members, and thus they called for a mistrial. Now, when she transforms back into her normal self, she collapses due to the amount of alcohol in her system. This too happens in the comics during the bar scene. However, they do change things up slightly for the show. Whilst she's getting fired here, the source material had Holden Holloway going to hire her, and then she collapsed in front of him after taking the job. This does get played upon later, but I thought I'd just bring it up here as well to show how they sort of differentiate. Now She-Hulk is all about becoming your best self, and that's why we've teamed up with Manscaped to bring you their Platinum Package 4.0. It's the biggest bundle they've ever offered, and it comes with the Lawnmower 4.0, the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Trimmer, the Ultra Premium Body Wash, Ultra Premium 2-in-1 Shampoo and Conditioner, Ultra Premium Deodorant, Crop Preserver Anti-Chafing Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray, Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs, and 
the shed travel bag to keep your kit safe. Like I said, massive giveaway, and inside it you'll find the Lawnmower 4.0, which has ceramic blades that make it the safest shave ever. It's got advanced skin safe technology, and you will marvel at the way it stops you from getting nicks and cuts. Add to this that it's also waterproof, and it comes with a spotlight on the front to help you shave in the dark. Now the kit also comes with the Weed Whacker, which is by far the best ear and nose trimmer that I've ever used. I've been using Manscaped for about a year now, and it always gets the job done quickly, and I absolutely love this piece. Now in addition to all this you can upgrade your shower routine with the ultra premium body wash and also the ultra premium shampoo and conditioner. It's two in one, puts together the best of both worlds like the Smart Hulk and it will keep you mean, green and clean. Maybe not green but it'll definitely keep you clean. Now after you've given yourself the perfect haircut you can also use the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant Spray that will keep your abomination nice and fresh. It's got a soothing aloe vera formula and it's the best in the business when it comes to keeping you dry and also smelling great. Manscaped have also included two free gifts. This includes the anti-chafing boxer briefs that will make sure your Hulk never gets a rash and the shed travel bag so you can take your kit, protect it, wherever you want to go. Mexico, the lot. Go to manscaped.com and enter the code HEAVYSPOILERS at checkout to get 20% off and also free shipping. That's manscaped.com, HEAVYSPOILERS at checkout, 20% off and free shipping. Manscaped.com, heavy spoilers, 20% off, free shipping, I'll see you over there. Cheers. Now after she's let go, she's unable to get a job because she's seen as a liability and we watch as she's fallen on hard times. She gets a voicemail from her cousin Bruce and rejection after rejection. One thing I love here is that the offices get worse and worse and worse and she goes from a swanky one all the way through to a crappy law firm, cementing how desperate she is. We cut back to her home and see several takeaway boxes and also lots of open bottles of wine. In the comics, Jen drank quite a lot and was always out partying and along with her getting fired from her job, she was also kicked out of Avengers Mansion. Now on Jen's laptop, there's some really, really big easter eggs. We firstly see up top that there are some Iron Man 3 sneakers which are based on Jordans and Air Force Ones. Next though, is what could potentially be a reference to Wolverine. As we saw from the end of Ms. Marvel, mutants are coming to the MCU, and this could be a little hint towards Weapon X. The headline reads, Man fights with metal claws in bar brawl, potentially hinting to Logan popping up very soon. The one below that says, Why there is a giant statue of a man sticking out of the ocean. I think that this is the first reference in the MCU to the ending of the Eternals, which so far hasn't really been acknowledged. Jen's lock screen is Captain America's ass, and this calls back to not only the post credit scene of last week, but also Ant-Man saying America's ass in Endgame. Also, I know you're probably screaming at the screen right now, there's a QR code there, there's a QR code there. Yeah, scan that, you get yourself another free She-Hulk comic. I'm always saving your money. You son of a bitch. <laughs> now along the top, we can also see stuff like Find Ant-Man, which is probably referencing how Scott Lang has become a bit of a celebrity. Ms. Marvel showed us that he now had a podcast and the Quantumania trailer had him at a book reading where we discover he'd become a celeb. Could also just be like a where's Wally or where's Waldo thing if you're in the US. Now there's also a Norse mythology tab as well as an Avengers one too. Now she visits her family and her dad asks her if Hawkeye collects his arrows, which I think Kate Bishop also did in that Disney Plus series. It's a bit of an awkward meal with them just constantly asking her questions that suggests she hasn't got her life together. Her dad seems to genuinely care though, and in the comics he was a county sheriff who ended up dying in a car accident. Here though, they've changed things up, so she has a bit more of a family relationship, and with her cousin Bruce being in it too, it's all about family. Now this series is very much taking a lot of inspiration from Ali McBeal. This comes across in its fourth wall breaking moments, the humour, and also the general procedural style built around a female protagonist. We get a little nod to this when Jen revisits the bar and we can catch the show playing on the TV. This is where Holden comes in to hire her, calling back to the comics. She's recruited to work at GLKH, a logo of which looks similar to the original way that they had the She-Hulk logo before it changed up. Now the name GLKH is a reference to several Marvel creators. The G is for Marvel publisher Martin Goodman, the L is for Lieber, as in Stanley's original surname, Kurtzberg is a reference to Jack Kirby's original name, and Holloway, well, that's not a reference to anything, but he's the only partner that we actually meet. The comics actually have Holloway harboring a dark secret that I don't want to spoil just yet in case they go that way. However, there's a specific reason that he's hired Jen to protect superhumans, which we might get a reveal to later down the line. 
and we cut to Monday and see her heading into work. She's greeted by Holden and given a tour of the building. In the comics, a similar scene happened, but it was revealed that Holden was actually a shapeshifter called Ditto who was just masquerading as her boss. That's not a spoiler by the way, he just takes Jen up to the office where she meets the real Holden, that's not the dark secret yet, I, I haven't ruined it, I promise. Now either way, he tells her that he wants her to be the head of the superhuman division, which is the position she also gets in the comics. I think every week she'll probably just be dealing with a different case, with next week's probably being the abomination before we head into the other ones. Now he wants her to appear as the She-Hulk in court, but this is the opposite of the comics. Whereas she hates going as her in the show, the source material had her not really wanting to turn back to Jen because she couldn't accept who she really was. She's turned into a spectacle and we even see the receptionist taking a quick photo as she passes by. Anyway, it's your favourite part of the show, it's definitely your favourite part of the show isn't it? It's Jared's Easter Eggs. Now at this point we see her pass a co-worker who behind him has a cabinet full of comic book covers. This pulls directly from the Dan Slott run of comics where Jen, can I call you Jen? She herself is walking through the law firm, meets with a co-worker, and behind him has a collection of his own. Well guess what, these heroes were sellout chumps and licensed their likeness to these comic book companies to make a little bit more money on the side. Obviously She-Hulk has done this herself, but then we also see famous covers from other heroes such as Thor, Hulk, Captain Marvel and Captain America. The last of which calls back to the first Avenger, where in this movie we see an in-universe comic for the character based on the comics that were sold during the Second World War. They've obviously removed Bucky from the cover because the MCU version went a slightly different path and honestly they don't even look the same. I mean, look at them. Not even close. Really nice that they inserted this callback to the comics itself showing that the comics I exist in the non-comic... What day is... Oh my gosh, my head... Where's the Tylenol? Get out, you're fired again. Now Jen doesn't seem too enthusiastic about it, but she's got a corner office, her mate Nikki works as a paralegal, and we meet Pug. He's based on the character Augustus Pugliese, who worked at the law firm with her in the comics. He's played by Josh Segarra, who you might recognise from Arrow, and I'm expecting him to make a bigger impact in the show at some point. Pug was a love interest for Jen, so I can see this sort of developing as we get further into the series. Anyway, her first case is Emil Blonsky, aka The Abomination. One of the first villains in the MCU, he's had a change of heart, and hey, maybe he's changed. Now, he's being held in the damage controlled Supermax prison that we first saw in Ms. Marvel. Though this hasn't been given a specific name, it looks extremely similar to the cube from the comics. This too is a Supermax prison designed to hold superhumans, and it's also the same place that we saw Wong and Abomination going into in Shang-Chi. We'll talk about this more later on, but it's clear that this is happening alongside that film, with a fight scene being something that's brought up at the end of the entry. Whereas she wasn't allowed to be in gen form in the office, here she's told the opposite. She's taken through a red laser grid which she nervously steps through, and this could be a callback to episode 1, in that Hulk melted down her blood sample using the same sort of lasers, so it explains why she's so nervous here. And there's lots of Silence of the Lambs references, with the gods leading her down whilst explaining all the rules. Jen even jokes about some fava beans and a nice Chianti, which is of course a callback to that movie and Hannibal Lecter's infamous prison scene. <laughs> However, Emil is perfectly charming and pretty different to how he was in The Incredible Hulk. Tim Roth has always been a great actor with good comedic timing, but they never really leaned into that in The Incredible Hulk. However, here they play it up and also talk about Emil's lineage. At the time of the first movie, there was a lot of talk about how they changed him up because he was Croatian and Yugoslavian in the comics. However, Yugoslavia no longer exists and also with Roth being British, they just changed it up. Now he was a Royal Marines commando on loan to the American army and he was put in place to take Banner out. He genuinely feels regret over attacking Bruce and the Hulk and to be honest, the guy, he's kinda got a bad rap. Hulk destroyed a lot of cities and he was also seen as a monster but he became a hero after the Battle of New York. Emil though never really got that chance and he's been in jail since. He even wrote Bruce a lovely and thoughtful letter apologising for how he acted and I, I believe in second chances. Bring Jared back, go on bring him back, even, even if he's the worst part of the videos. I can't stay mad at him. Now speaking of the worst part of the video, it's on to theory time. 
So Emil clearly believes that he could have been a hero, and this is cemented by this line. I thought I was going to be, you know, Captain Bloody America, something. He thought he could become like Captain America, and you know who else this is like? John Walker. Now he was recruited by Val, and I believe that a similar thing will happen with Abomination, where he's drafted into the US Special Forces in order to pay for his crimes. We know from the Marvel Slate announcement at Comic Con that there's a Thunderbolts movie on the way, and this will likely feature people like John Walker, Zemo, and Abomination. Now in case you don't know, the Thunderbolts are basically Marvel's answer to the Suicide Squad, and these are reformed villains that end up trying to do good in order to right the wrongs of the past. With Abomination's case coming up next week, I think that Jen might even put forth the idea that he does a sort of community service thing, and that he uses his powers for good. He could end up being drafted into the Thunderbolts, and this would be a way for him to win back his freedom. He's clearly changed, and he might even be a big help in the rumoured upcoming World War Hulk film that we'll talk about later on in the video. Anyway, that's in a theory time. Now you might also notice that there are red lasers around the cell, and tying back to the ones from earlier, these might actually be capable of killing Hulks. Would explain how it was able to destroy her blood last week, and also why it's here. Might also just hurt someone with powers, but I'm guessing we'll probably see the explanation for this in a future episode. Jen learns that the serum given to him caused the abomination to be created, but technically it was the homie the leader who gave him the final dose that ended up transforming him. Either way, Jen sees an in here, with Emil being used as a patsy to cover for the government. We also find out that he's got seven soulmates who brought him property, and this is clearly poking fun at people who end up falling in love with prisoners. No one ever falls in love with me, but it gives Jen some hope that she can help him out. However, she wants to double check with Bruce, and we discover he's actually on the Sicarian courier ship that we saw last week. Now once more, this is clearly setting things up for a World War Hulk storyline. That book centered around Hulk arriving on Sakaar, and here he was enslaved as a gladiator. Hulk ended up creating a rebellion, and he overthrew the ruler of the planet to supplant himself. He married a warrior that was once part of the Emperor's forces, and she fell pregnant. However, the ship he was sent in exploded, and this killed her along with a large number of his people. He returned to Earth as part of the World War Hulk storyline, and he went to war with all the Marvel heroes. It's an incredible book packed with outstanding action scenes, and if they do end up adapting this, then it could be a major thing for the Hulk. I know a lot of people are kind of meh on how he's been neutered, and this storyline would allow him to go back to being a monster. Now Hulk eventually discovered that his son survived this, and he became the character Scar. This could be a way to take Hulk in the future, with him becoming a father figure, and us getting a more ruly Hulk to follow. Now, in case you don't know, the rights to the Hulk have been tied up with Universal for decades now, and the only way Marvel get to use him in movies is through having him guest star. That's why he's always in things like The Avengers, Ragnarok, and shows like this. They can use him as long as he's not the main character, which is why The Incredible Hulk is produced by Universal. Now, I think those rights actually come to an end next year, and this would give them the opportunity to start World War Hulk, introduce his son, let Mark Ruffalo bow out, and follow the characters that he helped set up. He might not quit, I don't know, it's all legal issues really, uh, that I don't know that much about. So pretty useless information there, but uh, Jen accepts the job, and she says she has a strategy, but this all goes to hell when we see the fight scene from Shang-Chi. Now I think that the next episode will probably centre around Jen trying to see if she can have this excused, but I don't know if the government will be too happy about it. He's clearly been sneaking out a lot, and I think rather than getting his freedom, he'll be forced to work it off in the Thunderbolts. I'm also guessing that next week we'll have the one cameo that we saw in the teasers, as he's of course going to have to explain what's going on. He might go as a character witness or someone to help show Emil has changed. I think Jen will probably be mad that he said he doesn't turn into the Abomination anymore, but she's still going to defend him. It would be wrong of her not to, and this keeps things in line with the comics, as we did have sorcerers visiting the law firm. However, in the source material, it was Doctor Strange instead of Wong. However, Wong is the Sorcerer Supreme at the moment, so that makes more sense. The post credit scene is Jen basically doing all the heavy lifting jobs at her family's, and this includes holding up a car, putting a flat screen on the wall, and carrying in some water. A huge shout out to you guys for pointing out some Easter eggs on our last video. This included that the final scene was a reference to the trial of the Incredible Hulk. I think Ryan Airy pointed it out on his video, but I'm not, I'm never, I'll never give him credit. Or acknowledge that he even exists. He's the wor worst YouTuber ever. Shut the f up, Ryan Airy. Doug's all right, though. There was also Bruce's helmet from Sakaar hanging up in the, the little Mexico getaway. Now, as for our thoughts on the episode, again, 
I thought this was okay, but it's still not something that has massively won me round. Yes, Kevin's spoilers has turned into the very thing he sought to destroy, some d**khead who just moans about everything. I'm saying it's okay though, I'm not saying it's terrible, but I don't think it's amazing either. I think it just, for me personally, it just kind of sits in that mid-range bracket. Might be because I'm a man, as many of you have pointed out, and also might be because I'm a massive sexist, as you, you've correctly, you've figured it out, you've, you've figured out my agenda. The only reason that I think She-Hulk might be okay is because I'm a massive sexist and I hate women. But moving on from that, let me explain exactly why I feel this way. So I actually think that the way that these shows have been released would have worked better as a binge. The first episode was pretty much just Jen going through the paces, and this one was about her losing her job and then getting a new one handed to her on a plate. I still do kind of feel that the show is lacking any real struggles for her, but like many of you have said, that might be the point. Because everything just works out for her, we might start to see the real challenges come from the new job, and that will be what she has to overcome. It's a bit difficult to probably give fully fleshed out thoughts when we're so early in, but whenever I skip the review part of videos, I always get people kicking off, so you just can't win. Just being honest with that, and I hope that this at least shows that I don't say everything's amazing just because I get early access. I do think the show is really held up by the performances, and though the writing is okay, I want to see a bit more to really bring this up to the level of the other superhero shows that have released this year. This episode also felt really short, and it ended at a weird point. There's been this weird two-act structure to both episodes, with the first having the origin story, and then the court scene. Second episode had a weird structure to it as well where she lost her job and then decided to take the one with a new legal law firm. Really, it felt like a two-parter because of this with a cliffhanger obviously leading into next week. I'm not sure there's enough here though to really grip me to that point where I'm desperate to learn about next time though, so doing a two-parter this early on, it, it just feels a bit weird. Now I think if the series had have been released all at once then it would have been fine and this wouldn't have felt so short and weirdly paced out. I know the Dan slot run is great, but yeah, I just think the series could have structured it a lot better. Now I'd obviously love to hear your thoughts, I'm looking forward to getting called a shill when I finally say I actually liked an episode, and yeah, I'm sorry for being a negative Nancy, but that's just how I bloody feel. Kevin Feige, uh, don't blacklist me please. Now we are in a competition right now, and giving away 3 copies of Top Gun Maverick on the 15th of September, and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now. So if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of House of the Dragon, which will be linked on screen right now. It's a new bloody Game of Thrones thing. Is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? Well, we'll talk about it. So hopefully I see you over there right after this. By the way, thanks for sticking through the video. Peace.